pitch darkness, as black as a crow with its eyes shut. Then a solitary candle spluttered into life. Then another and another until the whole tent was lit by a hundred dancing flames. And there was Phineas the priest mumbling the words of some ancient prayer in front of the God box, the holy ark the Israelites had lugged round with them for centuries. Out of the blazing Egyptian desert they'd carried it until finally they'd arrived here in the land of Canaan, their so-called promised land, a land their leaders had told them would be flowing with milk and honey. Blood and honey, more like. The Canaanites had tried to kick them out, and then the fighting had started. And when the Canaanites had been smashed, the Philistines moved in with their high-tech chariots and their ground-to-air spears. But at least there were some parts of Canaan that were out of Philistine spear throw. And finally, the Holy Ark had arrived at its resting place, here, at the Holy Shrine of Shiloh. <laughs> Phineas finished his prayer, scratched his bottom and opened the tent flap. He was surrounded by fairground stalls. He went among them collecting money from the tills. For the Ark T-shirts, the Ark mugs, the miniature Ark pencil sharpeners, the Ark burgers, the I've seen the God box at Shiloh camel stickers. Dip, dip, dip. What was that tapping sound? Dip, dip, dip. Out of the throng came a blind old man with a stick. It was Eli, the high priest, being led by a small boy. Samuel, said the old man, bring me to my son. The little boy led Eli up to Phineas, who winced in disgust as his father's blind fingers explored his face. Is all well at the shrine, Phineas? asked the old man anxiously. Do the people worship our God and no other? Of course, father, said Phineas. That's not true. You're selling statues of the corn god, piped up the little boy. Foolish peasant child, laughed Phineas. These aren't corn gods. They're ornamental candlesticks. The little boy breathed in to speak again, but he never got the words out. His world went black as dunk. The statue crashed into the side of his face. Oh, dear. I don't think Samuel's feeling too well, Phineas explained to his blind father. That night, Eli awoke with a start. The door handle was turning. Now the door was opening. Now soft footsteps were padding towards him. Ah! Ah! Help! gasped the old priest. What do you want, master? asked Samuel, his eyes bleary with tiredness. Oh, it's you, is it? said Eli crossly. I don't want anything. Go away. Then why did you call me, master? I did not call you. You must have dreamt it. Go back to sleep. So Samuel toddled off again, and Eli went back to sleep, and soon the only sound in the room was Eli's wheezy snore. What do you want, master? Eli shot up again. Is that you, Samuel? Yes, master. You called me again. I did not call you again. I was fast asleep, having a lovely dream about a herring. Now, go back to bed. So once more, Samuel toddled off, and Eli went back to his herring. It was a beautiful herring, riding a plum-coloured camel across a sea of marigolds. And it was calling to him. What was it saying? He couldn't quite hear. He, he bent his ear forward to listen. What was it? What was it? What do you want, master? Eli could not believe it. He could not believe it. He'd only just got back to sleep, and this, this boy, this stupid... And then it dawned on him. There'd always been something a bit strange about Samuel, hadn't there? Could he be the one? The God of the Israelites had been very quiet lately. Could he be about to speak through this boy? Samuel, said the old priest, only this time he wasn't cross anymore. Go back to bed, and if you hear the voice again, simply say, I'm listening. What have you got to tell me? Yes, master. Good night, said Samuel, and he disappeared into the shadows. Next day, the priests moved among the crowd, jangling buckets. Money for the God of the Israelites, shouted Phinehas, for he loppeth off the heads of our enemies, yea, and their arms and legs also. 
Money for the corn god, added his brother Hoffney, for only he can guarantee at the 50% increase in your annual turnover. And forget if not the rain god, said another priest, for only he can ensure it that all your irrigation and sanitation problems are washed away for a very small investment. Stop! roared Eli above the hullabaloo, and the crowd fell silent. Then he turned to the little boy by his side and said, Samuel, did anyone speak to you last night? Yes, Master, replied Samuel, the God of the Israelites. The crowd gasped. This was the kind of stuff you wanted at a place like Shiloh. And what did he tell you? There was a long silence then. I'm scared, Master. I'm scared to death. There is no need for fear, said Eli, although deep inside he was even more petrified than the little boy. Give the people their message from their God. That's what he told you to do, isn't it? Samuel gave a long, lonely sigh, and he closed his eyes, and he started to hum, and he started to beat a rhythm, and the crowd began to sway as he chanted his tuneless chant. There's a storm coming, there's a thunderstorm coming. It'll blow away the greed from this land, blow away the false gods from this land, blow away, blow away, blow away, Phineas! Blow away, blow away, blow away, Hoffney! You let them do it, Eli, you didn't stop them. Blow away, blow away, blow away, all your sons, all your sons, you let them do it, Israelites. You didn't stop them. A terrible thing will strike you, and you will be amazed. The crowd on their knees. Only the priests were left standing, quivering with fear. Our God has spoken, said Eli. And he went indoors, a broken man. Bit by bit, word spread round Canaan that a seriously powerful holy man was around, till by the time he'd grown up, when Samuel spoke, all the Israelites listened. Then one day, an Israelite from the north staggered into Shiloh, covered in blood. The Philistines have taken our town, he gasped. It was a massacre. The Israelites roared with anger and turned to Samuel. What shall we do, they cried. Yes. What shall they do, Phineas? said Samuel, with this strange smile on his lips. Phineas couldn't believe his luck. At last, a chance to prove to the Israelites that when it came to seriously powerful guys, Samuel was nowhere. I will lead an army, he shouted, and we will drive the Philistine dogs out of the land of Canaan. Yes, we will, added his brother Hophni, not to be outdone. With the God Box to lead us, nothing can defeat us. Hooray, hooray, hooray! when the Israelites, and they lifted the God box onto their shoulders and they charged off into battle. Samuel turned to Eli. The judgment has begun, he said. The two men waited and they waited. A couple of days later, the northerner staggered back into Shiloh again. We were defeated, he said. The box has been taken. Hophni and Phineas were hacked to pieces. Eli rose to speak, but a choking, throttling sound was the only noise that came out of his mouth. Then he spun round and toppled forward, his head crashing against his chair. Samuel closed the priest's sightless eyes. His old friend and master was dead. The Philistines were moving and grooving and getting on down. They couldn't believe their luck. The Israelites had walked into that ambush, just walked into it. Over at the Philistine temple, the god box had been dumped in front of a huge statue of the corn god, and kids were clambering all over it, sliding down it, scribbling on it. Oi, 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 get off, said a priest. There's a god in there, it'll bite you. Woo, freaky, went the kids, and they ran off back to the dancing. Eventually, everybody decided it was time for bed, and one after another, the lights went off. Soon, the whole town was in darkness. Crash! All the lights came back on again. What was that terrible noise? They raced up to the temple. There was the corn god, but it wasn't massively towering over the god box anymore. It had crashed face down in front of it. It's all right, everyone. Don't panic. 
said the priest. It's just an accident. It's the wedges under its feet. You see, they always give a bit when people start dancing. It's the vibrations. They shift the wedges. Oh, yeah, the wedges, said everyone a bit nervously. And they heaved the statue back onto its feet. They slipped the wedges under again. And then, whew, they all went off to bed. Early next morning, the priest was carrying some brand new wedges across the square when crash! Oh no, not again, he thought, and he raced to the temple. Kaplonk, 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 something was rolling down the steps. Kaplonk, diddle little 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 came to a rest right at his feet. It was a head the broken stone head of the corn god. Now the people really started getting nervous. Get that horrible box out of here, they cried. Hang about, said the priest. I've got an idea. Why don't we lend the god box to the people over the hill? The people over the hill were over the moon. Look what we've got, a god box. Come on, let's celebrate. And they sat down to eat a slap up meal. But when the mayor took the first bite of his sandwich, yeah! there was a mouse in it. A mouse in the mashed potato, mice in the trifle, mice swimming about in the soup. There were mice everywhere, in their beds, under their tables, in their clothes, in their hair. The whole town was full of little grey, furry rodents. Come on, they shouted. Let's get rid of that god box. It's that flipping god box what's doing it. Get rid of it quick. The next town didn't have a problem with mice. Their problem was piles. They sat down in front of a nice piece of Philistine art and waited to see if a god would pop out of the god box. And then their bottoms began to itch, and their bottoms began to ache, and their bottoms began to throb. Oh, Dad, said a little boy, I've got a great big swelling. I know, son, replied his father. It's piles. That god box has given us all flipping piles. From town to town went the box, and everywhere there was big trouble. The Philistines were at their wits' end. Their entire population was riddled with mice and crippled with piles. Early next morning, a delegation with a white flag rode into Shiloh. Samuel, they said, you can have your box back. I'm not sure I want it, replied Samuel with a smile. Oh, please, they said, we're ever so sorry. Samuel said nothing. Look, um, we've got some lovely presents for you. There's this enormous gold mouse and this even bigger gold pile. Thank you very much, said Samuel. They're very nice. But after they'd gone, he turned to the Israelites. Sharpen up your swords, lads, he said. We're going to catch ourselves some Philistines.